drugs in Jesus' name last week. But I, I have a little bit of direction for the church, and I'm going to take this opportunity today to, to just share some of that vision and some of that purpose. I've told you of late that I felt like God wanted us to shift gears on Sunday morning to evangelism. And uh, so, m- rather than the Inside Out series, which took a good few months just to help us tweak our spirits, uh, we're going to look for the opportunity to bring people to church and Pray him through the Holy Ghost, help him to make a decision to live for God and be baptized. Uh, so that means we need people here like that. And probably one of the biggest challenges that we have as a church, being so long term established uh, and having lifestyles that are separated to God, uh, we don't cross paths a lot of times with people outside of work. Uh, You know, we don't go to the bars with them. We don't go to some of the places they do. So uh, a lot of us don't have a lot of friends outside the church. So that makes it a bit of a challenge to bring our friends to church because so many of our friends are already in church. And so uh, we're going to I don't know how God's going to help us break that barrier. But as a church, we've never really broken that barrier. We've never really gotten a good flow of of visitors. And I believe God's still going to help us with that. So I'm going to be sensitive to how God wants to help us do that. And so I want you to understand my motive here. I'm not being punitive or I'm not in any way saying that we're not doing what we need to do as a church. I am saying that God's trying to break us out of where we are so we can reach more people. And so we're going to hunt and peck until we figure out what helps us break through like that. So today, I, I feel like sharing a few things uh, that God put into my spirit this week, but also talking a little bit of how we go forward. So instead of a typical sermon, it's kind of a time of ministry, and I'm going to ask my wife to say a few things as well. So would you just pray that God would have his way in the next few minutes here and minister to our hearts. God, I pray that you would talk to us today. We want to obey you. We want to go to this place that you promised that you would take us. We want to see done what you said would be done. We want to Embrace the future. We want to go into this thing that you promised to do in faith and in confidence and in joy. And I pray that you would help us as we move that direction. I trust you to help us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. My wife and I had the privilege of going to New York City last Thursday, Friday, and Saturday to the World Network of Prayer Conference. That's in the New York metric metro district Uh, new york metro district just is new york city and uh, i don't i think they have 40 some churches or whatever they have several large churches uh and god did a lot of amazing things brother stone king was supposed to be there but he was sick so uh another evangelist by the name of brother herring was there and ministered and thursday night he ministered on faith and uh he ministered to people who needed to be healed, and uh, they counted over 60 people who were healed in that service. And there were sessions Thursday night, several Thursday nights, several Fridays, several Friday nights, several Saturday morning. And uh, there was so much good stuff there that I bought the DVD set for that, and I've given it to Sister Hart, so that should be an inspiration soon. If you want to check, the, maybe we can check those out DVD by DVD rather than the whole set. And so if you want to get a little taste of it, we're going to be telling you a little bit about what God said and what he did in that, that weekend uh, so we can bring it home to you. Uh, but one of the, the big things that stuck out to me that I'm going to start with was something that the superintendent of the New York Metro District, Brother Dawson, said. He was talking to everyone about Maybe they're going through things. Maybe they're being tested. But he encouraged them to remember that whenever you're being tested, that means you're up for a promotion. God will test you and he'll try you not not to say, oh, you failed. I want to give you an F. It's really we get it backwards even in school. When when you take a test in school, it's supposed to measure whether you're ready to go on or not. It's not supposed to tell everybody if you're smart or stupid. Uh, and we, our school system, so, uh, so many people and so hard uh, to just get everybody through that we don't always help students understand that. And it's just not 
normal for us to understand that. So if we're not explain if that's not explained to us early on, we soon, you know, by second or third grade, we're just nervous about tests because we need to get a C or dad's going to be mad. And then we start feeling stupid or we start feeling like, oh, bad me, I got a D or whatever. Well, if you didn't study, that, you know, that it's showing you that if you don't study, you don't learn, you better study. And th so there needs to be some pressure. But sometimes we feel the pressure, but we don't realize what we're doing is we're, we're learning things and then we're making sure we've got it and then we're going on to something else. And why that's so important is because let, let's suppose your math is the most obvious one. Most of you hit eighth grade algebra and you crashed. Or geometry. It was either algebra or geometry. Most, most of you had trouble with one or the other, just the way the brain works. And if you didn't, you're exceptional, but that's most, most of you. And many of you who had trouble when you went to algebra or, or geometry, it was because in fourth grade, you really didn't do too well in a subject, but you got through with a C or D, and you just were ready to move on. But if you didn't get it, you don't have it. So later on, another class is drawing on that, and now you're trying to learn this new thing, and you didn't even get the old thing. So the way education should work is we should make you pass well before we let you go on so you're not frustrated. Not to call you stupid or not to say you're D or whatever. It's just, if you didn't get it, well, let's work with it. Let's, you can get it. Let's talk some more. If you don't have, know, understand fractions, when you get to algebra, it's just going to drive you crazy. So when you're being tested by God, he's not trying to decide whether he loves you or not. He's not trying to decide if you're going to heaven or not. He's just trying to decide if you're ready to go to even a better place in him or not. If, if you feel like he's putting you in a situation where you're having to trust him more than you've ever had to trust him before, you feel the pressure like, oh, I've got to pass this test, and if I don't, he's going to be mad at me. But that, that's not the point at all. The point is, I've got this place of trust over here that I want you to live in. There's this place of peace that you can live in that you're not living in right now. And so I'm going to teach you about it, and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to live it. And if you don't do it well, we'll go back and we'll deal with it some more. And if we're not careful... We get in this rut where we get stuck. We never pass the test because we're so afraid. and we're, We don't look at it as an opportunity. It's more like, oh, no, here comes a test. And, I, and some of us even withdraw and, and just try to get through. We don't try to pass the test. We just try to get through the experience. And so God has to bring back to teaching. And we never get to move on to that place where he wants us to move on to. And... One thing that stuck out to me is as we read from Matthew chapter 6. In fact, if we could bring up Matthew chapter 6, verses 12 through 15 in the Amplified Bible. Uh, Brother Dawson was teaching on the Lord's Prayer. It was a prayer conference after all. And I was reading what he was reading, but I was reading from the Amplified Bible. And something really stood out to me in the way it says things in the brackets. It says, and forgive us our debts as... We also have forgiven, left remitted, and let go of, everyone say let go of, the debts, and have given up resentment against our debtors. Some of you may have forgiven people, but you've not given up the resentment. That's a big thing. So what God will do is he'll put you in a situation where you realize you still have resentment against somebody. You'll, you'll be with them and you'll just feel this resentment. Well, God is not telling you, you bad person, you still have resentment. God is saying, there's still resentment that I'd like to take out of your life. But you have to let go of it. So even though you've forgiven them, you might have to go back to the topic and start letting go of the resentment toward the people that you forgave. And you keep doing that until it's done. It's kind of like if you have... a uh, Way back in ancient history, before dishwashers, uh, I used to have the job of either washing or rinsing dishes. There was five of us kids, so we, we, somebody would wash, somebody would rinse, somebody would dry. She was, my mom was probably just trying to keep us out of trouble, standing there at the sink. And, uh, and so, uh, you love to be the rinser. 
because you, you don't have as much work, right? You just run water over. But then you could say, oh, no, you missed a spot. And you give it back to them. To... You, you just keep washing until you get it clean, right? That's what we do. You comb your hair. You comb it until it goes to the right place. Everything you do, you mow the lawn. You, if, it, if it's not cutting right, you go back and mow it again. You, you just do it till you get it right. So if we're forgiving somebody... You don't forgive him out of obligation to check it off. Yeah, I said forgive you so I get to go to heaven. It's like, I want to forgive. I want to get it out of my system. I want to let go of it. I want to move on with life. I, I, want to, I want to leave that with Jesus and get on with my life. So when you think and that pops up again, that's not God coming along and saying, you're bad. You still have that in your heart. That's God saying, no, still a little bit on that. Let's, let's wash that again. So... Let me read more of that and, and bring and lead. Bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Four, if you forgive people their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go and giving up resentment. Then your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their trespasses. Their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment. Neither will your father forgive you your trespasses. That's something that's been argued. Some people would say, well, God forgives and uh, it's unconditional. But Jesus is pretty plain here. He's saying, if this forgiveness thing's going to work, I forgive you and you forgive your neighbor. And then he goes to great lengths at other places to even tell parables like the parable of the man who had much forgiven and he didn't forgive his people who owed him things. And boy, God really put him in a bad light. So what I'm saying is what stuck out to me from Brother Dawson is that whether I'm being tested or whether God is bringing up things in my life, I need to look at them in a, in a positive light. Like God is doing something in me and he's helping me to see how to get it right. Instead of, oh, I failed this one again. I tried that last week and it didn't work. I tried it two years ago and it didn't work. And now I tried it again and it didn't work. And I'm just stupid. Or I just don't get it. Or my heart can't figure it out. Or I'm not sensitive. Or I have the giftings or all that kind of stuff. And uh, Don't look at it that way. He is your heavenly father. He loves you. He wants you to succeed. And so he's going to set you up for success. But he's not going to let you off the hook either. Because he loves you and he wants you to succeed. Sister Gonzalez then ministered to us. Brother and Sister Gonzalez were there. Uh, and she talked about the very thing we've been talking about around here for a good while. That the enemy is trying to shut our mouths. He's trying to intimidate us. And she used as an illustration a story that she told while she was here, I believe. If she didn't do it here, it was in our minister's conference, so I'm not sure if you heard it. But she, uh, she was raised in the church. She was a fourth-generation Pentecostal. She is. And when she was very young, like eight or nine years old, uh, there was somebody, unbeknownst to her parents, who began to abuse her. And for a good number of years, she was sexually abused. Even though she was in a good family, she was in the church. And I mean, preteen, very, very young. And she said, uh, the power of, of sexual abuse is the person perpetrating it, usually on a child, will say, if you tell anybody. And what this person did to her is, is threatened to ruin her parents' ministry. And so... Because of that intimidation, she wouldn't tell anybody. And so for years, she was sexually abused until finally she said something. And when the silence was broken, when the intimidation stopped working, it, it set her free. So the enemy comes along. <clears throat> and I use the illustration. It came back to me. <clears throat> God, God gives you and I this robe of righteousness. And he, he puts a badge on us. He makes us deputies. He deputizes us. And he says, I want you to go into the highways and the, high, uh, the byways. I want you to lay hands on the sick and I want them to be delivered. I want you to go out there and tell people about me. And, and we're going to just set people free and we're going to do these awesome things. So we step out there all excited. We've got faith. We got the badge. And the first person we come to, we start to minister to them. 
And the enemy, not them, the, the devil, uses the words they speak to fight back at what we're trying to do. Maybe to make us feel stupid. Maybe to argue something. And, and the enemy will try to find especially your weak point. Like if you feel inadequate with Scripture, he'll try to get the person you're talking to to say, well, give me some Scriptures. I don't think you know what you're talking about or whatever. Because he's trying to shut you up. That person is not trying to shut you up. The enemy is trying to shut you up. The enemy is more confident in you than you are. The enemy is more scared of Acts 2 ministries than we are confident in Acts 2 ministries. We've got more potential in New England than we think. But we look at our track record and how few people maybe have been added to the church. And all of those things try to intimidate us to where we, we psychologically are thinking, I hope we can just make it to heaven. I hope there's still a few of us left when Jesus comes. It's intimidation. And that's the spirit that is against us. You'll see it in politics. You'll see it in the world. I mean, in general, it's out there. If you don't agree with whoever's got the microphone, you're in trouble. And you'll be shamed. And, and if the law lets them go, you'll be beheaded. It's intimidation. So... I had some people pray in the, in, the, in the portion. I just led five minutes of prayer. And I'm going to have you do that right now, too, if you'll stand. I read this scripture from James chapter 5, verse 16. And again, from the Amplified Bible, James chapter 5 and verse 16. It says, confess to one another, therefore, your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins. And pray also for one another that you may be healed. And this is the part that stuck out. And restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. And that stuck out to me just because we've been through this long series on from the inside out. I believe God has helped many of you identify some areas of your life. But I also believe that I'm going to have to personally work on this and help you as a church to now change gears because we can be so focused on our heart issues that we think we need another three years before we're ready to minister to somebody. And I want us to pray for one another that God will just give us the confidence to go out there and minister to people even while we're in our private time working on our hearts. You can have unforgiveness. You can be working on that resentment in your heart and still tell somebody about Jesus and help them find him. You can have a leg and, and help an old lady across the street. So don't feel like you have to get everything fixed before you help anybody. As a body, God's, God's up to something. And I'll tell you some more stuff. My wife will to, to help you kind of see what he's up to. But God is not just flapping his jaws when he says he's doing an amazing thing, a big thing that he's going to add to the church not just our church he's doing something big this is the last push before he comes again so we have to engage in that and if we're if we're too afraid if we're a soldier and we got a bandage on our leg we may say well this disqualifies me and god said no i want you to take this gun and get out there you know uh, we'll keep that dressed and we'll get that healed but you're not so hurt that you can't get out there and do something and maybe you're on light, dude. Well, we'll put you, put you in the office and we'll still put you to work here. But you don't go home and go to bed and get out of the, the army altogether. So you and I need the courage to let God work on us. But too often our confidence is really in how well we're doing instead of in God. God is not going to minister to the people that I'm talking to because I'm doing so well. God's going to If I can help them open up, good things are going to happen. Somebody that you have confidence uh, in or that you have a little bit of rapport with, someone that you feel comfortable praying with, uh, that's not your family. If you'd move to men, women to women. Just, right? Am I going in and out too much here today? If you'll move to somebody that you can pray for, i like you just to pray for them uh, like we mentioned a while back. I'd like you to lay your hand on their forehead. So you're going to be putting your hand on their forehead. They're going to put your, their hand on your forehead. And the reason I'm asking you to do this physically is because 
I, I don't, I don't, I'm not encouraging you to stand there and both cry, oh God, we got problems. <laughs> I'm asking you to pray in faith for that person. They're, don't even pray for yourself. I want you to pray in faith. God, give them confidence. Lord, heal them and move them beyond. Make them fruitful in the kingdom. And pray that kind of a blessing. on. We're giving each other a blessing right now. So would you do that right now? Just put your hand on their forehead and pray blessing on them. In Jesus' name. It's showing full. Put it in. Let's try it though. Hallelujah. Let faith flow right now. Speak it in Jesus' name. He kalarara mara yesu talaha ele andora la borose te te de amotaho. God, let it flow in this house today. He kalarara mara hara bosa te te de alarara moroso ho rabate te de andare aboroso ta haye ke. God, heal us and move us forward. Give us confidence. Do work in our spirits today, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now let's give Him some praise. Yes, God, you're able, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If there's one principle that I see threading through dozens of themes that God's helped us with lately. It's this. We need to be diligent. We need to let God do work in us. But we must not focus on us. As soon as you focus on fixing yourself, as soon as you even focus on being good enough, it's, it's over. Because now it's about you. Even if you're witnessing to somebody, if you're doing it to fulfill your obligation, you don't really care about them. You're fixing, you know, you're getting your brownie points with God. And God wants us to, to let His love flow through us, and we need to care about them. And the fact that you know there's something wrong with you is probably just going to keep you from getting too high and mighty. And you're witnessing anyway, so that's probably a good little check there. Love them, tell them about Jesus. But if you're aware of your weakness, you're probably not going to be too snooty about it, and that's good. Uh, us Christians, if we start feeling good about ourselves, we get self-righteous and then the, the flow doesn't happen like it's supposed to happen. You may be seated. I'd like my wife to come and just share some of the thoughts that were put into her this weekend. You know, um, as we just go through life, we tend to forget some things. I tell my husband this, you know, sometimes it's like God reminds you of a principle or a concept and you think, yes, that is awesome. I'm going to hold on to that and never forget that. And every day I'm going to live like that. And then you look back a few months later and you're like, he brings it back to you again. We just forget. We're just human. And so this weekend was one of those times where God reminded me of how awesome he is. When you think about how God is not limited to time, God sees the beginning from the end. So it's all the same to him. And he is able to orchestrate lives and put people in positions to influence at certain times in certain places and with certain people. And to us looking on, it looks like, 
oh, wow, how nifty was that? They just happened to be there, and God just, blow. no. God was orchestrating, orchestrating their whole life and all of time, and he's been doing that. If you look at the Bible, look at the Old Testament, he had people at certain times. Joseph is a really good example. It looks to us like God gave him all of those dreams and promises, and then where did they all go? And he was in the pit. He was sold. He became a slave. He was in the prison for years and years and years, just going through life. But the, way, the reason I like Joseph as an example is because every place that he was put, he just did the best he could. He was the best steward of the house. He was the best prisoner in the prison. And he was just there. And it looks like, you know, when the baker and the butler were thrown into prison with him, we get our hopes up. Yes, God's going to bring him out, you know. But God didn't do that. He let him keep on waiting. That's a parallel to our lives. Look how many years we've just been going through our lives. Maybe nothing dramatic has happened. God hasn't put us before a king or anything. But it's important. What you're doing right now, you're preparing for where God's going to take you. And in one day, God took Joseph from the prison to the second in command. Well, that whole time, God had been grooming him. God knew the plan, and Joseph saved a whole country. Well, I feel like that's what God is, was emphasizing in this meeting this last few days, is that don't give up on the promises God has given you in one day. It's yeah. Suddenly, that's a word that God has put in our congregation. Suddenly, suddenly things are going to change. And I don't know how God's going to do it, but I know God is able. Yes, that's right. Hallelujah. Um, Brother Wilson, who is a UPC minister from Detroit, you probably have heard the stories of how they had a door open in the UN. And he was sharing with us at this conference, just get the big, big picture, I probably won't get all the details right, but um, because of the election, everything in politics is just all messed up. It's confusing. And the same thing has happened in the UN, that there's this great confusion. Everybody wants peace, but no one seems to know how to find it. Just this past week, Brother Wilson met with... Uh, a delegation from China and a delegation from India and a delegation from Japan and he said in each one of those meetings they all looked to him and they said to him what is the answer God opened the door <laughs> leaders these are it's a presidents and whatever they're called from all these countries they're all looking to him well, he never asked for that position. He never, you know, uh, had a campaign to get into the UN. God opened that door. Now God is opening other doors. That is a God thing. That is all orchestrated by God. God knew from the beginning. He knows where to put people. And he also gave us our personalities in our events. And he gave us those for a reason. Because the people that you will reach, I will never meet. And the people that I will reach, you will never meet. But God orchestrates it all. So I'm just speaking an encouraging word to you today that I know you might feel like, well, I'm not important and nothing great's going to happen to me. But the word of God said that in the last days, God is going to put his church on display. He is going to show it to the world what he has, his bride in this earth. And he says, we're going to stand before kings and important people so that everyone on the whole earth will hear this gospel and will have an opportunity to become a, a part of the kingdom of God. So you never know what your life is going to be. The important thing is we need to stay connected to him. We need to be sensitive to him and watch for the opportunity, not try to contrive something, but just say, here I am, God. I'm your vessel. I'm willing. And whatever he does with me, that's going to be awesome. Yeah. It's just awesome to be in the kingdom of God, Man. to have the Holy Ghost and to have that relationship with him. But to see what he's going to do in the last days, it's going to be beyond what you can ever imagine. And we have the privilege of being a part of that. So I, I say it's time to look up, raise your head, look up, because he is doing great things yeah. in this earth beyond what we even know. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. I trust you, Jesus. I look to you. Hallelujah. God, I, I like you to tell about what you saw. Brother Gonzalez was supposed to speak, and instead of speaking, there was just such a presence of God that uh, he began to minister and impart things. Uh, he mentioned several times that uh, at this particular meeting uh, in New York City, he saw more angels in that room than he'd ever seen any place. There was just there was just a, and it started out. In fact, uh, when I greeted the congregation, I'd mentioned I, I read what I actually had many of you read as we went through our prayer series about how a great revival happened. Many of you remember. First, it was a small prayer meeting, and then there was a bigger prayer meeting. And after a while, all of New York City was full of prayer meetings. There was thousands and thousands of people praying and how it spread from New York City up to New England and then it jumped over to uh, Wales and all of that. And uh, so I was encouraging them that God could do that again. And, that, and then God used several other people to talk about how God was going to use New York, this New York Metro meeting as an epicenter. And, and as the weekend went on, it became clear how God was reaching the, the whole world through that meeting, through that prayer meeting. That I have never been in a meeting outside of Call to War that was as powerful as that. And, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the night of intercession Friday night. Uh, we interceded. There must have been 500 people, and very few of them were not interceding right at that time. So in a room of 500 people, everybody interceding, you can imagine the kind of flow that was happening there. It, it was affecting the whole world. And Brother... Uh, Brother Gonzalez felt to impart gifts, so he imparted things to the congregation. And I want my wife just to tell what she saw at that time. Um, there were several times that people said there were many, many angels that were in the building. And um, as Brother Gonzalez began to minister, he said there, there were just a lot of angels there. And uh, God showed me this picture, our vision, where um, I, I just saw all these beings, and they were they were kind of dressed like you know Ethiopian people with the white long robes and white caps, and they were all dressed the same, but they were all different sizes. There was really short men, and and then there was big big tall ones, and all different sizes. And that shocked me because you always think about angels just being uniform, you know, but they were just they were all unique, and every single one of them. Um, they had, it kind of looked like caskets or boxes, beautiful boxes, and they were all carrying them, and they would come down the aisle, and they would carry their, their box like this, and then they would get to the front, and it would be taken, and they would just be gone. But there was just lots and lots of angels, and they, it was an awesome presence. It's hard to convey to you. We're trying to convey to you the big idea on the earth today. And what he was doing then is he was, uh, he was saying to us, I'm giving you these gifts because I'm about to do something. And it goes along with what he's been saying to our congregation, even through the gifts of the Spirit, saying, I, I put stuff into you and I'm going to use you like you've never been used before. And that still doesn't compute with us because we're thinking, Okay, I'd like to be used like I never was before, but I only have my bachelor's and I need my master's. And God's saying, no, it's not about you getting good enough. It's just, I'm gonna, if you'll just take these things and run with it, I'm going to use you as is, like you've never been used before. Not because you've gotten good, not because you've, uh, just because you're obedient. And one of the big concepts that Brother Gonzalez mentioned that stuck in my mind, and I hope I can help you to, to grab hold of it, is he said... One sentence that, that kind of clicked for me. He said, your greatest challenge is not an obstacle. It's a door. Let me see if I can explain that. The, great, the biggest thing you're dealing with right now, you look at as an obstacle. But God wants you to see it as a door. For example, the biggest obstacle that the children of Israel had was the Red Sea, right? The Red Sea was not an obstacle. The Red Sea was a door. In fact, when the door shut, all of the army was killed behind them. So it, God was using a positive thing. 
I'm going to switch mics. I don't know if we're having trouble with the whole sound system or what. But uh, the the story of David and Goliath. Are we having trouble with everything? The story of David and Goliath. You could, as a little shepherd boy, look at that giant as an obstacle. But that obstacle was really a door for David. That made him famous. People were willing to follow him as king because he faced his giant. You, Joseph's prison was just mentioned. That was not an obstacle. That was a doorway to his second in command in the kingdom. Hundreds of stories in the Bible were like that. So apply it to your life right now. You and I are having trouble with this confidence thing. Whatever is on your plate will always stand out to you as that test or that obstacle, almost like, oh, no, I hope I can make it through this one because, man, this could take me out. And we look at it. We have so little confidence in what God's going to do through us, and we have so much confidence in how we mess things up that we look at the, the person that we are trying to witness to and they are not responding. We look at that as, oh, no, I'm going to fail again. And God wants us to see that as a Saul, maybe, or somebody that if, if he can make it into their mind and into their heart, they could reach a lot of people. That's really an obstacle. But if we're still focused on us and we're, if we're still so aware of our faults, then we don't do that. It's, it's part of uh, the side effect. One of the greatest things about being a Christian is coming to church and hearing the word of God. But the side effect of being preached to again and again and again and again and again is almost every work week you hear about something you need to do better with. Right? So church can be, okay, I'm going to go listen to how I'm not good enough or I'm going to go listen to, and, and that's good. This is, a, you're being coached. You need to be honest with yourself. But sometimes we don't really pick up on he's powerful in me. And even while I'm working on becoming better, God's going to flow through me. And so we forget that. And that ties in with the, the last thing that I want to talk about here that my wife kind of alluded to. It's one of those things that I, I've learned it, and I practiced it, then I forgot it, and then I learned it again, then I practiced it, and then I forgot it. And that's this. Uh, well, well, let me illustrate it first. I, I used to play chess with my brother uh, when I was real young. He, he was a teenager. He was in high school. He was just learning to play chess, so he wanted to play with me. And I remember one night we played chess like for hours. And for a good hour of that, he kept winning in the same four or five moves. It's like he would move, and my logic would say, do this. And then he would, two or three moves later, say, checkmate. So it's like, okay, let's do this again. And so he'd move, and I'd move, and, he, and maybe it changed just a little bit. But somehow in his mind, he had a strategy, and he was nailing me every single time. We went on for a good hour. I don't know how many times I lost the game to him. And he did the same thing, and my brain couldn't figure out, okay, what's he doing? How do I outmaneuver him? And there's been things in my life that for years the enemy has blindsided me. And then God would reveal to me, hey, he's blindsiding you. And, and I'd be wise to it for a little while. But then just because it's my way of thinking, my natural way of responding to things, I slide back into being who I was. And he would just use my human nature or whatever to blindside me again. And for years and years, I can go on living beneath my privileges because he knows how to psych me up out or freak me out or worry me or push my buttons. So there's some of you that for years you wanted to be a good witness, but every time you try to witness, the same issue in your life rises up, and so you have this hang-up. You don't think you're ever going to be one of those people that's used of God mightily because so many times you haven't been. And God has to break that. God's trying to show you a blind spot. God's trying to get you to think differently about yourself. So let me just... Be vulnerable and give you a good, idea, a, a good illustration. I'm going to confess to you how this works with me, okay? God has, over the past few years, given me a sensitivity. And he's, he told me at one time he was going to help me to see into people's hearts. And so 
I imagined, you know, it's like this, ooh, ah, you know, you get up in. But, but that's not what happens. What happens is, uh, just without knowing it, I hear people say things, and I understand them. God makes me understand what they're saying. So they could even say, I love you, Brother Hansen, but if it's a sugary kind of, you know, you know, I can hear through that. Not me thinking it through. It's almost like they're buttering you up. Right? I, I, I don't, I'm not telling you all that, you know, I, I don't even know how it works. All right? I just know God makes me aware of that. And God has made me sensitive to spiritual things because of my role. Well, that means sometimes before a prayer group or before a service, I'll start feeling these things. I'll start feeling what the enemy is going to do. Or when I'm speaking to you sometimes, I'll feel doubt or I'll feel, uh, some of you may not even realize you're resisting me, but I'll feel that resistance. Here's the problem. I've been, I've been where you're at so long. I sat in the pew so long. I'm so aware of how I might be having a wrong attitude that usually when I feel something bad, I automatically think there's something wrong with me. So most of the time, I'm, most of my life, I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with me. What's wrong with me? Now I'm feeling bad. What's wrong with me? Now I'm feeling mad. What's wrong with me? And, and God has lately actually allowed me to feel a lot of those feelings. I'm not, I'm not a real... Uh, outward emotional guys, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't cry a lot. I don't uh, cut up, you know, real silly kind of thing. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It's just in my personality, right? And I don't usually tell people off, cuss them out in public and things like that, you know. Uh, but, but God's been allowing me to feel some strong emotions like that. And it hasn't computed. I've owned that. I felt those strong emotions, and I immediately think, why am I so mad? I need to go pray through. But what I'm really feeling is what the enemy is up to, or what other people's attitudes are. And I am so self-involved. I'm so worried about measuring up. I am so aware of my own humanity that, that I, God's ready for me to minister to somebody with a problem. But if I'm not careful, I back up and try to deal with the problem that's not even mine. Uh, this is just an illustration, so you don't have to understand all of that. I'm just confessing to you what happens. So we're heading to New York Metro to go to this conference Thursday. And I don't want to go. I'm just feeling like, I'm just feeling bummed out about going. I just, I don't look forward to going to New York City at all. We've lived here 20 years and I've been to New York City four times. Love Boston. I don't know what it is. I like to go to Boston. I don't like to go, go to New York City. So we're going to Brooklyn. Now Brooklyn is a rough part of New York. It's one of the boroughs there of New York City. Uh, I'm not looking forward to get there. We get there closer, and obviously, we, we picked a good time of the day, but even in a good time of the day, the traffic's horrible. And I'm driving through the, all this traffic, saying, why would people want to live here? Why do all these people come here? This is just crazy. Why, why do you want to come just fight the traffic? Everything's expensive. And then we get into Brooklyn, and I look around. It's like, these people are paying five times for their houses what we pay, and they're a third of the kind of house that we can get for that kind of money. It's like, and, and there's crime, and there's all this, and i just mad at New York City. It's like, I don't even want to be in a... And I'm, I'm thinking... Well, maybe we'll just go and we'll sl slip in the back and pray a little bit, and, you know, do. Uh, but I, I just don't feel gung-ho about this. And then it was raining to make it worse and cold. And, and the church there in Brooklyn is like a full city block. It seats 800 people or so. But there's absolutely no parking. When I say no parking, there's five parking places for the ministry team. Everybody else has to park on the streets. Well, in Brooklyn, the, the houses are like six or eight feet apart in this part of town. And so there's one parking place in front of every house. 
And then there's a fire hydrant every once in a while. So one night I had to go four blocks away. And I'm thinking, man, this is so inconvenient. And especially when you get out at about 1130 and I go for the car, I'm a white boy in a suit in the middle of New York City, in Brooklyn. It was a long walk to the car. So I'm feeling all these things, and I'm just, I'm just trying to pray myself back to Christianity, you know. <laughs> I'm just working on my attitude. And then as the weekend unfolded, we, we went into some intercession. We had some prayer meetings that, that, like I said, I can only compare it to call to war. It was as powerful as call to war was, only it was a whole different group of people I've never been with. And... Uh, I didn't even know, uh, we, we thought we'd just go blend in, but they, they had me on the platform every night, and then they had me praying, and they had me leading some things, and so I didn't even know how involved I was going to be. But our, 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 call, our intercession period of time, I mean everybody, all the, all the people who were running the show, everybody, all the superintendents, everybody was on their face interceding. It was a mighty, mighty intercession. And we were interceding for the world. I'm probably going to show that video, uh, although it's a prayer meeting, and let you hear some of the stories that Brother Herring told about intercession, some things that happened. Uh, in the first night, he told a bunch of stories about great healings and people being raised from the dead in his ministry. Uh, that's the Thursday night session. The Friday night session is not in the packet because I'm going to show that at some point uh, because that reminded me this church has been called to break through in this region. You are primarily intercessors. And one thing Brother Herring said in his sermon on intercession is that Brother Cole saw millions of, or thousands of people I think he said some over a million people. But anyway, it was at least thousands, hundreds of thousands of people filled with the Holy Ghost in his ministry. But Sister Cole was the intercessor. And she would lay on the floor like for six hours a day interceding for some of these things that he went to. And she told Brother Herring that if you're an intercession... Before God uses in you, you in intercession, the first thing you're going to feel is depression. And that's how she described it. But many of you know what I mean. It's a burden of the Lord. So you'll start feeling bad. So he can get you to pray. Let me show you the dynamic. If you don't think you're such a good person and God wants you to pray, he'll start making you feel bad to pray. But if you're stuck on how bad you are, you will stop and try to deal with you instead of just interceding. So Brother Herring challenged us, and this is something I've learned and forgotten or didn't learn well. He said, don't try to meditate away your depression. If you're feeling bad about yourself, Maybe take a few minutes and repent and stuff like that. But God's not really looking for three days of you beating yourself up and saying, how bad I am, I need to fix this and go do another Bible study and, uh, you know, go back and ask yourself, what four things am I doing wrong? What five things do I need to do now? But most of you are at a place where if you're feeling bad, the very first thing you should check is, am I supposed to be praying about something? What is the enemy up to? What is God up to? And quit thinking about you. It's not about how good you are. God's, God wants to work on you, but at least for a season, at least give him a few weeks. The, the, when you're feeling angry, your first thought should not be, why am I such a grouch? Your first thought should be, what is, what is up here? Is there something happening in the spirit here? Am I supposed to be ministering to somebody? Is there somebody who has anger in their life that God wants me to help? Is the enemy trying to come against me? That kind of thing. So would you stand right now? I, I, I want you to get this. I want you to learn this so you can forget it and then learn it again. I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush. Not everybody in here has the same ministry of intercession. But as a church, 
Although God has promised we're going to be big. Our goal is not big. Our goal is really even not just numbers of people. Uh, right now, we're, in a, we're going to focus on the harvest, and we're going to let God bring people in, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But you still are primarily, the reason my wife and I, I believe, we're supposed to be at that conference is because of our role in this region and your role in this region. We're, break, we're breaking through in this state. We're breaking through in this region in ways you don't even know, you don't even understand. And we have picked fights with the principalities and the powers of this region. So when a principality or power comes against you, you're going to feel bad. But if every time you feel bad, you blame it on you, all they have to do is come along, make you feel bad, and they've got you out for a couple days. They've just, they've just, they took you out. So help yourself with this. Quit feeling so bad about yourself. Quit, blame, quit letting the enemy turn that around and make you feel bad about yourself. If you've done something wrong, prayer, forgiveness is good. You know, confession works, and that's about all it takes. But because I've, God has identified some things in your life through Max, some of you may still be back on, oh, now I've, I've got something in my heart. I've got something in my subconscious. And you can get stuck trying to medicate that or take care of that. And, and then when something's happening in the spirit, you think it's about you instead of about what's happening in the spirit. So we're going to pray again. And I'm going to ask you, I'm trying to part some things that were imparted to me, okay? Uh, I, I got a to-go box and I brought it home and I want to share it with you. We're going to pray that God would give you discernment. That you'd be able to tell when it's something you need to mess with or repent about, you know, that kind of stuff. And when God is trying to use you in intercession or in ministry of some kind. And I'm, I'm just going to take a quick poll here. How many of you in the last month outside of the church services or meetings have gone into full-fledged intercession. Just raise your hand. Okay, about four or five of all of you, right? And I'm not telling you what you did wrong. I'm, I'm trying to help you understand. How many of you in the last month have really felt bad about yourself at some point? You misidentified it. Very possibly. God probably meant for 80% of us to be praying about something. But we took that to mean we're bad and we went to, you know, introspection. So what if over the last month, 80% of us would have been interceding? There might have been people in this room who needed the Holy Ghost today. But if we're preoccupied with what's wrong with this, we don't intercede and then God can't do what he wants to do. Does that make sense to you? So we're going to pray, God, open our eyes and help us, help us to not be so guilt ridden that every time we feel something, we immediately go to there's something wrong with me. Help us to have so much confidence in you and so much confidence in what he's done in us that when we feel something bad, our first thought is what is the enemy up to? What is God up to? I would say first God, first ask you, what's God up to or what is the enemy up to? And if you're feeling, if you just have a fight with your, your wife or your husband, well, sometimes that happens and I'm not saying it doesn't happen among Christians, but I'm saying if you guys are both cranky at each other, you probably need to pray. Not about your marriage so much as about something. Something's working on you. Something's heavy on you. And if you're not going to prayer and you're not letting that burden go in prayer, you're just going to be cranky. And you, I'm not going to keep having you raise your hand, but some of you who've been a little feeling bad about yourself have been nonplussed because you can't figure out why you feel bad about yourself. Because it's not about you. It's about a burden God's putting on you. So we're praying for one thing. God, give me discernment. So the next time there's something happening spiritually that I'm supposed to be doing something about, that I don't immediately let the enemy get me thinking about me and my problems and my hangups and uh, my inner issues and all that kind of stuff. But, but I can be uh, aware of, okay, what do we do about this thing? It may be, uh, 
let me give you an example. The Stevanovich has just told me about going to UConn this week, and this is part of a praise report. UConn had their first meeting, three first-time guests at UConn this week. I don't know how Genevieve's day was, but Stevanovich has had a hectic day, and she had a migraine headache, and they couldn't work out some scheduling and stuff. And, and so I've noticed every time God is trying to do something, there's things that happen, and if I make it about me, I just think I'm probably not the person that's supposed to do this because I have a headache. I'm probably not supposed to, you know. If God wanted this to happen, why isn't he working it out? And we start doing all that hyperanalyzing when we just need to realize if we're doing what God wants us to do, we're very likely going to feel something. If you're on your way to prayer group and you just feel bad and you, your flesh feels like it doesn't want to go there, it, then something good could happen that night. Just push through that thing. Just, just go there expecting God to do something. And... We forget this because it doesn't make sense. Bad doesn't usually make us think good. That's why that sentence hit me so hard. Your greatest challenge is not an obstacle, it's a door. If the next time you feel heavy, next time you feel mad, next time you feel worried, next time you feel like you're a failure, look at that as a door. I wonder what God's going to do through that. I wonder how he's going to use that. That's the kind of discernment I'm praying for. Would you, would you, as I pray for you, would you receive that kind of discernment right now? God, I, I, right now impart to each one who is willing and open an understanding a discernment that they might be able to see plainly what is happening, that they would not be deceived by the enemy, that they, they would not live a life of condemnation, that they would not live in fear, that they would not live in self-analyzing all of the time, Lord, but that they would believe who they are, that they would believe that they are called and they are chosen, that they'd be, be able to believe that, God, you are going to use them. You are going to change lives. You are going to do the impossible. You are going to change this region through them. Let them see clearly. Let them be able to sort it out accurately, Lord. Let them be able to, 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 to submit their feelings to you, God, and be able to know exactly what it is that you're doing so they can cooperate with you in that. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I just have a couple more things to, to share. God's doing things. I, I mentioned UConn. We went to prayer group last week, and uh, as most of you know, because I've allowed our prayer group in Mustap to kind of be uh, an example of how God uses groups to reach out. Uh, it can also be frustrating because even though we have sometimes 10, 15 people in prayer group, not a lot of them come back here to church with us. So my own flesh, that, that hasn't been very satisfying. I want to see more people in church. But uh, God is changing their lives, and we see that every once in a while. For example, one of the, the men who hosts, I mentioned a few months ago, was baptized. And then we showed up last week, and uh, he couldn't hardly contain himself. And finally, we let him tell us what he wanted to tell us. And he, he had some vials of water from the Jordan River, and he gave one to the Stevanoviches, one to Rosados, and a couple to us. And he was just thrilled because a lady had gone there, and she had snuck a bottle home and uh, gave it to him. So now we each have a little bit of water out of the Jordan River. But this is a guy who wouldn't even get near prayer group at first. And last week he came and sat, and he, this is about the fourth time he's actually come and participated in the prayer group. God is doing things. But, but someone like that, if I go to prayer group and they're real standoffish, I can think maybe I'm not a good prayer group leader, or maybe it's my personality, or maybe we should have brought bean dip instead of cheese dip and you know you can think all kinds of stuff you you and we need to get over that i i'm there on behalf of god and god's going to do stuff and if he, if there's something there well i may pray about that i may think about that i'm not going to focus a whole lot on it but i'm not going to own it that makes sense it may sound dangerous for a preacher to say don't own it because a lot of times we're getting people to own things but uh, once you have a relationship with God, if you're in relationship with God, if you've had your morning prayer, then the rest of the day, he's probably not going to make you feel heavy about who you are. The rest of the day, it's probably about something else that God is trying to do through you. So this is what I felt challenged to do over the next little while. I'm believing God for 10 people to be baptized in Jesus' name 
as soon as possible, ASAP. So this is what I feel to do. On Sunday mornings, that's when we're going to focus on people getting the Holy Ghost and being saved. If we get here and there's no guests, I'm not preaching. We may just have an intercession prayer meeting. Uh, there's a couple guys that were ready to preach today, but we had no nobody here who doesn't know the gospel. So I told them, save their sermons. That's why I didn't know which way to go. I let God, God choose that. But I, I'm, I'm serious about this. We, you great people. I love you. I love to get together with you, but I'm not interested in talking to you for the next 20 years about your hearts and your minds and things like that. I'm, a, I'm interested in these pews being full of people. So we're going to be teaching Bible studies and we're going to be believing. We're going to continue to do our prayer groups. We're going to continue to outreach and don't go into this guilt trip of, no, oh, I've got to go win souls. Just do what you're doing without guilt, without shame, and believe God to connect you with people who will be sitting here in these services. And when there's nobody here who needs the gospel, we're going to do something else, and it may just be a prayer meeting. If you're tired of praying, bring somebody with you next week. <laughs> Kidnap them or something. And uh, I'm believing for God to fill 10 people with the Holy Ghost. But... The goal is 10 people being baptized. So uh, unless God tells me otherwise, I'm not going to preach to you on a Sunday morning until 10 people have been baptized in Jesus' name. Now, I, I, I'm not so arrogant to think, oh, that's going to move you. you. You might rather hear from these other people anyway. But I'm just telling you as a reminder, if, if it's six weeks down the road and you're saying, why isn't the preacher doing his job? He is doing his job. In fact, I might go in the other room and just intercede while you guys are having church or something because I, I'm, I'm ready to break through this thing. And again, I'm not telling you you're not doing things. Many of you have witnessed. Many of you invited. I'm not saying we're not doing it. I'm just saying we're going to break through in the spirit until we see it in the flesh. We're, we're going to pray until we see people here getting baptized in Jesus' name. God's doing some amazing things. But we're the ones that have to flesh it out. But if we're overwhelmed with guilt, we're miserable doing it. If we're overwhelmed with confidence, you know, if next week there's nobody here, but we invited and we tried, well, then let's pray. Let's just break through. We're not going to feel guilty and look around and say, nobody's here. We're not doing our job. We're going to say, okay, they didn't come. God needs to put a little more pressure on them. Let's get down on our knees. Let's get on our faces. Let's pray. Let's birth this thing. Let's let this thing come to pass. So just so you know what's happening, I won't say it a lot, but there's a few guys I've asked to preach, and they may have to just have a sermon ready to go. But the gospel's uh, easy to preach, and they won't have to study a long, long time. They have in their, their Bible, they're ready, instant in season and out of season. We have a few guests here, boom. If God wants me to preach in two weeks, then he'll get people, 10 people baptized and next week, and then we'll go, go on, I'll, I'll be preaching. But uh, just so you know, I'm not mad at you. But I'm not going to preach to you on Sunday morning anymore until there's some new folks in the pews and some people who've been baptized in Jesus' name. I want to share one more thing that happened and then read a passage to you before we go today. Uh, remember, this is all positive. I'm, I'm just trying to help you identify you, some of you, are miserable because you have so much to give and it's all stuck inside of you. It's really a fire shut up in your bones and you don't realize, you know, you just think that you're stir crazy. It's a fire shut up in your bones. God's wanting to flow through you. You're, he's ready. He doesn't need you to become more spiritual. You just, we just need to connect with some people who need it. He just needs to turn that tap on. You're bloated. He needs to turn that tap on and let some of that flow out. So one of the highlights for me was this. My wife mentioned that God puts us at different places, and my wife and I have been amazed over the last few years. Even that uh, I was elected superintendent, I've had a, a lot of opportunities to connect. Um, in June, we're going to be videoing that project I mentioned to you that's going to be published by the publishing house and promoted by World Network of Prayer. So all over the world, people are going to be doing the prayer group 
was sourced here. God told us we would affect the world, and that's one way that he's going to do that thing. But another thing happened. Uh, my wife mentioned Art Wilson. I just want to explain for those of you who maybe don't know a lot about him. He is a pastor from Detroit. He, he, uh, there was a lady who w- was uh, from overseas. She was a delegate at the U.N., she had a connection with him. He baptized her, and that became a connection to the U.N., the United Nations. And, and eventually, they asked him to come be the goodwill ambassador of the United Nations. So he now has a prayer meeting or Bible study in the United Nations building. And we've had multiple people get the Holy Ghost in the United Nations building over the last few years. Amazing. Uh, other major denominations aren't there, but God has put a oneness apostolic man in the United Nations. And uh, there were three uh, delegates from other nations at the World Network of Prayer meeting. We prayed for them. They were there working on his team. And we prayed for a promotion because he, he's saying if, if he would just get one promotion, he would then be able to uh, get missionaries into countries with budgets. Not, I mean, some of these places like Iraq, where if you get in, you might get killed. Well, he, he could be in a place where he could get them in on a red carpet with money to reach the lost. God is going to put his people on display, like my wife said. This is a very real thing. During Brother Art Wilson's section, session, the second session he did, they actually turned all the video off. So there's not a DVD of it because he doesn't want the things getting out that were happening there. But... He was telling us about some of these opportunities that God has opened up. And I don't know how many of you remember that video we watched uh, uh, by Jonathan Kahn. Uh, of, what was the name of it? Um, Harbinger. The Harbinger. Uh, it's also called Isaiah, whatever chapter that was. Uh, Jonathan Kahn is a Jewish rabbi who is... Uh, evangelical you know he that he's a jew who's evangelical he's of the messianic uh christians when brother lee stone king went to the united nations and gave his testimony how many of you seen that united nations testimony it's it's on youtube uh he he got up before the joint session the united nations global council and he gave his testimony and preached Acts 2.38 to the whole world, all the nations of the world. That has now had over three or four million hits. And now everybody who becomes a part of the United Nations, everybody who becomes on staff has to go watch that. So every day there's 250 views of that all around the world. Jesus' name, one God, apostolic. That's the kind of thing... God keeps telling us he's going to do these kind of, that's the kind of thing he's going to do. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know. Maybe our involvement is what just happened last week. I don't know how he's going to use us, but we need to quit feeling like if we could only get good, God's going to do something. God is doing it right now, and he's ready to use you right now. You could be the connection. You could know someone in Boston who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. And when Brother Stone King was there, Jonathan Kahn came to meet them. And because Brother Wilson had invited him, and when when he got there, the first thing he said was, how did you get here? Because nobody gets in the U.N. Brother Art Wilson gets in the most secure part of the U.N. that's possible. And a few months ago, a group of 70 ministers, including Brother Bernard, were able to go to the United Nations and have a service right there in the United Nations. Nobody gets to do that. And Brother Khan met with Brother Art Wilson and Brother Stone King, and they prayed for him, and he spoke in tongues right there in the United Nations building. So God's doing a global thing. And the thing that was neat for me is at the very end, Brother Dawson, actually Sister Shaw, who runs World Network of Prayer, invited Brother Art Wilson to come down to the front. And he invited all of the ministry team to come stand around him. So we were going to pray for him. I, uh, he, he was facing the audience like this. And I came in from this side. And I kind of came in behind him. 
because I wanted to let some of the other men get in front and pray for him. Uh, I was just going to be low key and pray for him. I put my hand on his shoulder and started praying for him. Well, the superintendent of the New York district was right next to me. He was the only person further behind him than I was. And Sister Shaw came and handed him the microphone to pray for him. We were going to pray a prayer for global harvest. We're going to pray a prayer for God to loose finances and, and missionaries, all those things that Art Wilson just talked about. And we started to pray, and Brother Dawson handed me the microphone. So I was the one that got to pray and speak over Art Wilson for global harvest, global revival. That's how you're affecting the world, right there. I don't know what's going to happen of that, out of that. But I'm saying, why do we keep beating ourselves up? Why do we let the enemy take every little feeling that we have and make us feel like we're another failure? You are not a failure. You have been called. You're special. God's. How many times has he told us, I want to use you? You're going to do awesome things. But how many times do we stay stuck in that mindset of, oh, we're just nobodies. We're from the quiet corner. We're, we don't have much money. We, but we're not a very big church, all of that kind of stuff. They didn't, they didn't check how many people came to Sunday morning service before they handed me the mic. God just put us in those situations. So would you stand? I want to I read a passage of Scripture to you. Um, I won't have them put it up because I want you just to hear it. I want you to hear this from me. I want you to hear this from God. <laughs> Take this personally. Every time you cross my mind, I break out in exclamations of thanks to God. Each exclamation is a trigger of, to prayer. I find myself praying for you with a glad heart. I'm so pleased that you have continued on with us, believing and proclaiming God's message from the day you heard it right up to the present. There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that God who started his great work in you would keep at it, bringing it to a flourishing finish on the very day Jesus Christ appears. It's not all at all fanciful for me to think this way about you. My prayers and hopes have deep roots in reality. You have, after all, stuck with me all the way from the time I was thrown in jail, put on trial, and came out of it in one piece. All along, you have experienced with me the most generous help from God. He knows how much I love you and miss you these days. Sometimes I think I feel as strongly about you as Christ does. Obviously, this is Paul talking, but some of the same sentiments are in my heart for you. So this is my prayer that your love will flourish, and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus would be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all, getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. Acts 2 Ministries, I'm convinced that he who has begun a good work in you is well able to do it. Yes, you do have to watch yourself. Yes, you do have to be introspective when the Holy Ghost makes you be introspective. But half the time you're being introspective is not God trying to make you introspective. It's the enemy trying to keep you from being who God has called you to be. So we're not going to have an altar call because you might misconstrue that as, okay, we've got to do better here. We're going to just end with, with a song of praise. And we're going to thank God for giving us yet another little opportunity to have a little bit of a part of a worldwide movement that's, that's just going to shake the whole world. And we're going to believe God to give us 10 people baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. So can we end on that just rejoicing? Let's just thank God for what he's going to do as we sing this.